for the month of February, what I'm going to do is cover those three and four legged options trades, and then we'll final it out with hedging. But in order to do all of that and calculate the proper notional value, we have to talk about the options Greeks. And I'm sure you might have attended my options Greek session before, but if you haven't, it is my favorite session to talk about. So I tend to take all the questions and we'll go very deep into it. But the really beauty of understanding the options Greeks is the positive and negative factors that affect your options. And when we talk about advanced option strategies, three and four legged option strategies, I'm going to use the Greeks the entire time. And when we get to hedging, because we're going to do it on overall portfolio level. So we have to know beta and delta really, really well. And so we'll do some calculations and that, that'll that get us all the way to the end where we're going to do it on a portfolio level. So really excited for this series. Thank you for your feedback. I want to make sure whenever we're doing these type of education sessions, they are geared around you. So please feel free to give us more feedback. It's always helpful. These sessions are for you, not me. So without further ado, let's talk about the options Greeks. Um, and as always, if you haven't attended an options education session with us, our, our motto on the options play education arm is empowering you to trade sustainably and confidently. And that really means that, in my personal opinion, the empowering part of understanding, investing, and in financial independence is a foundation based on financial literacy. And so you can confidently trade and you can confidently make decisions, especially in these complex type of products, if you understand it really, really well. And so that's the crux of this. We all learn differently. Sometimes the way that you like to learn isn't necessarily the best way to learn, which is interesting, lots of studies around that, but that's the intent of these sessions. So the best investment you can make is in your education. So I commend you for being here today. And as always, there are risks involved with options. Just have to give you a disclosure. I'm going to pull up some examples of stocks today. They're purely for informational and educational purposes only. Know that options involve risk. They're not suitable for everybody. At your brokerage firm, you have to have a separate agreement. You have to read something that the OCC puts out called the Options Disclosure Document, also known as the Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options. That just goes through educational aspects of how options work. But nonetheless, know that... It, it does involve risk. This does not constitute financial, personal, individual advice, legal, or tax, just for educational purposes only. Love a good disclosure. <laughs> um, and here's more for your reading pleasure. All right, now, if you have attended any beginner sessions with me, or an options plan general, you will see this slide. And the reason why we build out this slide is for the options Greeks. And there is an intent behind all of our madness. When we talk about options premiums and the way that we discuss it, it is all intended for you to understand the session for today. So if it's the first time that you're ever seeing the options Greeks, but you attended that session, congratulations, this is gonna work. And I'm really excited to have those light bulb moments because that's really the intent of it. If you've never seen this chart before, definitely gonna give you a brief explanation. So this is a T-chart. I was first introduced to this when I took my series seven over a decade ago, and it helps you understand how options really work. When you're learning options for the first time, it's best to start with understanding long calls because everything else is essentially a mirror. You can utilize this diagram to just figure everything else out. So we have calls on the left-hand side, puts are going to be at the right-hand side, bullish strategies are on the top, and bearish strategies are on the bottom. You'll notice some similarities. Again, this works for the Greeks as well, all less delta, where you can use that mirror aspect. So that's where this is really, really helpful. But the foundational aspects of this that we have to know in order to move forward is when we're purchasing options we are expecting a sharp directional movement in our desired direction. That's our goal. We want a, a magnitude move. We are speculating from a sharp. Sharp is, is there for a reason. Time decay is negative for us because we purchased, uh, purchased that option for a premium. That premium usually involves extrinsic value, which is time value and implied volatility. And that's a decaying factor that will eventually be depleted as we move towards expiration. Hence why we need a sharp directional move. We have to overcome that time value that we've purchased. Those are long options. 
if it's a call, that directional move is just upwards. If it's a put, it's downwards. Now, if we sell options, we're not expecting a sharp directional move. We are neutral and have a slight directional bias. Therefore, we sell the option, we collect the upfront premium. If it depletes in value, we want to be able to buy it to close at a lower price. And that's why time decay is positive, because as that option nears expiration and loses its value, it allows us to buy to close that option at a lower price. These are the goals associated with each individual leg of the option. When we talk about options Greeks, we're going to net them together. Today, we're going to make sure that you understand the Greeks inside and out. And on our next sessions, we're going to do three and four-legged options, and we're going to net the Greeks together quite a bit. So it's important that you understand this, and this is the foundational elements required to move forward. We want to make sure this is crystal clear. If not, pop in some questions. You can put a one in the chat or an emoji, however you're feeling. Happy we hit 5,000 today, clearly, but all right. So why study the greets? What is the, thank you for the thumbs up. I, I appreciate that. I was wondering where those were. <laughs> so it's important to understand the why behind this. I went through it briefly, but it's options pricing. The Greeks are just a measurement of the effect of different factors on your options premium. An options premium is comprised then more than just the underlying security. It's derived from the underlying security, but there's also those extrinsic value components like time value and implied volatility that we have to understand when those change, what happens to the options premium. And it's also logical and it helps you really just understand your ideal environment. What are the positive and negative factors? That leads to strike selection. There are, if you ever pull up an options chain, it can be quite overwhelming because there are just so many strikes that you can choose from. Understanding the Greeks helps you choose optimal strikes because we know the goal of our options. And if we know the goal, like on the previous slide, then we need to specify that goal with the strike selection. The Greeks are going to help us do that. And of course, that also leads to understanding our expiration dates. And even more importantly, position management. I love the way that the Greeks change when you're on max profit and it helps you show when you have synthetic options. There's just so much beauty to the Greeks that explain concepts we already know, but gives you the data behind it, but also can help you spot anomalies and optimal environments to open and close your strategy. So that's really the beauty of it. All right. And if you haven't seen the slide before, this is the last of the, the foundational reviews is just an options price. So important to know this because we're going to build out on it. The premium, I've said it multiple times, just intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Intrinsic value is your executable value. So if this contracts uh, a ABC 130 days to expiration call that's trading at a premium of five and ABC is at 103. I got the right to buy at 100, can immediately sell at the market at 103, exercise those rights. Wouldn't make sense because there's extrinsic value of $2 and that's made up of the time value and implied volatility, which do adjust over time and of course changes in implied volatility. And we're going to focus more on the effect of changes at this moment. All right. Now, what affects an options premium? This is how we wrap our head around the Greeks, and we want to understand the positive and negative factors for options. So let's do this exercise with me in your head. Maybe one day we'll allow videos for everyone. That would, that would be fun. Um, so if you have a stock that moves above your strike price for a long call, that's going to be make the long call more valuable. That's a positive effect on my long option because it's moving more in my favor. My long call becomes more desirable. Inverse is true for your long put. It's less valuable because we a long put contains the right to sell. And if the underlying security is moving up, then the right to sell may be better, be a better price found on the market rather than what's contained within the contract. If the st stock moves if the stock moves below the strike price, less valuable for the long call, makes sense. And then the inverse is also true for the long put. That's more valuable because now we have a right to sell. If the stock is lower, then our option is more favorable than the market price. Very simple stuff that I expect you to already know if you're attending this session. If there is less time until expiration and we have long options, regardless if it's a call or a put, that's less valuable. That's a negative factor. And if there is an anticipated movement, so we're holding an option, a long call or a long put, 
And all of a sudden we're getting closer to that event in March for Apple or earnings is coming up. We're going to experience an increase in implied volatility, which is subsequently going to make the premium more expensive, which makes the long options more value regardless if it's a call or a put. We just explained all of the Greeks there, but now we're going to give them their name and put everything together, but want to make sure that makes perfect sense before we move on. So um, we don't have to do the numbers this time, but if you want to throw up some thumbs up emojis or stop for questions, I'm going to watch it throughout because we can tend to move through this one. Lots of thumbs up. Great. All right, let's talk about Delta. This is the textbook definition. How much does my option move if the underlying moves by $1? So option is a derivative derived by the underlying security. Delta is going to tell us what happens to that option's premium if the underlying security moves. And remember, because there are other factors, it doesn't necessarily move one for one. And so this will tell us by how much it's going to move. So that's the textbook definition. Delta is a theoretical estimate of how much an option's value may change given $1 move up or down in the underlying security. So on an options chain, you might see a delta of 0.3 or 0.6. All that means is if the stock moves up by $1, your new premium is going to move up by 30 cents. And then if it has a 0.3 delta and your new premium will move up by 60 cents if it has a 0.6 delta. Very simple and straightforward. And how it's measured is really important to understand the other Greeks. Delta is on a range from negative one to positive one. And zero is just neutral. We'll put it that way. If the underlying moves in your favor, the deltas are going to magnify. So for example, if I have a long call, a long call that's at the money normally has a 0.5 delta. As it gets deeper in the money, it's going to get closer to one because it has more moneyness. The one for the long call is my destination because as it as the option moves or the underlying moves in my options favor, it's going to get closer to one. The deltas are going to magnify. The inverse is true for the put, magnifies, but just to the negative side because it's moving more in my favor. That's important to think of. I like to say that delta is the destination, but delta also has the most uses out of all of the options, Greeks. So if we have the stock moving up in valuable or moving up in price, it makes the long call more valuable. Just like I said there, delta, the delta value will move closer to one and the long put, it's less valuable. So if it's not moving in our favor, then it moves closer to zero away from our destination. Remember our destinations are on either end, depending if you're on a call or a put. So something to keep in mind, going to be important as we uh, put everything together and get into gamma. Now, all bullish strategies will have a positive delta and all bearish strategies will have a negative delta on an individual basis or if you net everything together. When we talk about advanced strategies, as in multi-leg, we talk about a strategy driver and we'll even do that with a covered call and we'll say the deltas are taking over on a covered call because a short call on an individual basis has a negative delta. It's a bearish strategy because you profit as long as the underlying is at or below the strike price for a short call. But as soon as you add 100 shares of a security, you flip the deltas to positive, but you still reduce them, which makes sense in a way because you're reducing your upwards potential. That's what a covered call does. And so you're reducing your exposure, your traction to the underlying security. It's a great way of um, explaining how deltas work just to reveal if you in your entire portfolio or an individual position, or if you trade one security quite a bit, what your directional bias is, because you would you you do have one. So moving on, this is a screenshot of an options chain of Shopify. And it is an older one. And I like using older options chains because then you can review what happened and there are your receipts essentially. Now an at the money option like I said, is around a 0.5 delta. And what I've done here is I'm giving you a very deep in the money option. So your destination, this is a 30 days until expiration option when the screenshot was taken. I'm giving you a slightly out of the money option. And there's some reasons for that. I've given you the mid price. And so, so we can get an idea of the moneyness and the extrinsic and in, in, intrinsic value of the option. 
and this will all help the other Greeks really put into play. So we'll do this consistently. The deep in the money option, that's basically at its destination. Because remember, if I'm buying a call, I want it to go up in value as much as possible because I'm accepting, I'm expecting a sharp directional move. So you can see all those goals really tie in to what we're talking about here. It's worth about 1243. That's the mid price. And it has the least amount of extrinsic value based on all of these. And that's something that happens when you are working with options is they can go so deep in the money that they start losing their extrinsic value. We say they start acting like a stock, which makes sense. They'll have a delta close to one. And then if you get a delta of one means if the stock moves a dollar, the option's going to move a dollar. It moves in tandem with the underlying security. That's where it's at. It's at its destination. But you lose, you lose a little bit of traction. It tends to be a little illiquid. You notice there is little volume and open interest here, but that is a very deep in the money option is going to have a delta closer to one. And at the money option is going to have a delta closer to 0.5. And this is also where a great way to explain probabilities, a delta is also used for probabilities. So 50% probability of being in the money at expiration makes sense. 0.5, it's going to move a penny and it will be in the money or not. It's That's literally where that comes from. This is where the most extrinsic value is. 291 is at that that at the money option right there. And then a farther out of the money option is gonna be closer to zero. So 0.29 has less extrinsic value. Remember, it's not all, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the takeaway from this is I want you to see what a deep in the money option delta looks like, and what an at the money option delta looks like, and what an out of the money option looks like. I've got them highlighted here and delta is this column if you, uh, cannot see that. And you can see as you just go further deeper in the money on the options chain, how Delta is increasing in, in value or magnifying. I like to use the word magnifying. So moving on, how do we actually use Delta? I gave you a lot of this is netting strategies together. Your bullish strategy is going to have a positive Delta. Your bearish strategy is going to have a negative Delta combined. You can do that on all of your contracts, you can do it on your portfolio. And what's really helpful with that is there are a lot of strategies out there that have various names and they could be coined on a Reddit forum or something like that, but an option will do what it's going to do. And if you wanna understand if there is a directional bias or the traction that's there, your directional risk, just netting your deltas will give you that indication because an option will do what it's going to do regardless of its name. For example, Gave this to you a little bit earlier for the covered call. A long 100 shares is equivalent to a, a delta of one. That's, and that makes sense if we think about the mathematics there. When we add a short call, we're giving up our upwards exposure. So we're reducing our directional risk. Now we have a delta of 0.7. And that's a, also a good way to think about when we select covered calls. And if you've ever attended that session, we generally say a 0.2 or even a 0.15 delta because it is further out of the money. It has a higher probability of expiring out of the money, but it's also allowing you to still prioritize capital appreciation because when we're selling a covered call, you're giving up your upwards risk. Another way of looking at it is netting the deltas together. Your stock is a delta of one. When we're selling a call, you're reducing your exposure and you don't want to reduce it to 0.5. That's, that would be terrible. That, that, that wouldn't make any sense. So this is a, just an example of how you can net everything together and still see a directional bias in a very simple terms with a covered call. Um, and at the money straddle, I think is always a great one to use because this is very commonly used to trade around earnings or at least give you an indication of price movement. But if you really want to look at a neutral strategy, you need a delta that's essentially flat. This, even though this is a, when this was taken, it was normalized. This is an at the money straddle. It has a slight directional bias to the call side because it's positive. It's ever so slightly still very neutralized, but it gives you an indication of directional risk. And this makes sense for an at the money straddle because it's profitable as long as the underlying moves more than the net premium paid in either direction. You're super directional at this point. So if you are doing a strategy like that, you would want to make sure that your deltas are essentially flat and you don't have a slight directional bias. Otherwise, if you have a directional bias, let's not do that trade. 
And hopefully you gathered this one. Utilizing Delta can give you your stock sensitivity. How sensitive am I to the stock? So that covered call example, if the covered call wasn't there and it was just the stock, you have a Delta of one, that means the underlying moves $1.00 then my position moves by $1. In this case, we reduced it. It moves by $1. My position moves by 70 cents. And that's because of the capped gain potential that you have there. So the traction as in how, how exposed am I to the underlying security? And remember, acting like the stock, if it moves to positive one, that means it's acting like long 100 shares. If it moves to negative one, it's acting like short 100 shares. And the most commonly used is assessing probability of in the money at expiration. We talked about that briefly, but the 0.2 means it has a 20% probability of expiring um, in the money and an 80% of out of the money. And therefore that would be better for an option that we're looking to short and we profit from it expiring worthless. So giving you those probabilities helps assess your entire strategy. And then it also just a good idea to understand where you want your option to go. A long option is going to benefit from greater deltas. So going to either one, your positive one or negative one, positive one on the call side, negative one on the put side, and then short options, the inverse. You want it to get to zero. And that's your destination, zero or one or negative one in the case of a put. And hold on to that. That helps you, helps you know gamma. All right, so let's put this together. We should know, and we're gonna just mark the positive and negative factors for each one of the Greeks, less row. Sorry, I don't have that one for you today. But for Delta, hopefully we get this right. What do we think it's gonna be for a long call, positive or negative? It's going to be positive. And it is positive for bullish strategies because we net them together and it gives us our directional bias. So therefore, if it's positive for a long call, which is a bullish strategy, positive for a short put, which is a bullish strategy, it must be negative for the bearish strategies. So that's your positive and negative factors. Delta is the going to give us our directional bias. Everything else we we'll, we'll, can you use the mirror for. All right, moving on. Let's talk about theta. So theta tells us how much my option will lose each day as it approaches expiration. And when I was first taught theta and introduced to it, somebody told me, remember time decay and put in T and theta, but that's not necessarily true. Theta represents daily decay, yes, but it is a it measures extrinsic value in the equation. So it's not just time, it is the implied volatility factor and dividends and interest rate risk. All of the items that make up the extrinsic value is the component of theta decay. That's why we like to teach it with intrinsic and extrinsic. So you just separate extrinsic and quit calling it time value, it's extrinsic. So theta is all else equal, if one day goes by, how much will my option premium lose? That's what it tells us. When we say all other factors remaining the same or all else equal, meaning implied volatility doesn't change and the stock is exactly where it is. So if one day passes, you have a theta of 0.3. That means you lose 30 cents of premium. If one day passes and you have a theta of 0.6, then you lose 60 cents of premium. And it tends to get higher and higher. You have a higher daily theta decay, the closer you get to expiration. And we'll, of course, talk about that in more detail. Oh, and sorry, I did not fix that. Now, how is theta measured? Theta is in dollar values. So it can be any figure. I remember when Amazon was 2000 a share, that used to have a very high up, upwards of $40 theta because it's a daily premium decay. So it can be any amount. It's a dollar value. It is something that benefits short options, so sellers, and it does not benefit. It's not favorable for options that we're buying. And that makes sense because time is working against us as it moves towards expiration. It is losing value. And if we're buying an option, that's something we have to overcome. That's why we don't hold them till expiration. We want to be able to sell to close back some of that theta we purchased. And... If we sold the option, 
we want to be able to buy it to close at a lower price while still accounting for proper theta decay without giving us our gamma risk, which we'll talk about in a moment because that's also a little seesaw. But in short, theta favors the seller and hurts the buyer. Moving around. All right. So if you have less time until expiration, a long call is less valuable, long put less valuable, theta will then increase, magnify, because it has more decay. Remember, it's a dollar value. So if it's less valuable, eventually an option at expiration is generally worth only its executable value or intrinsic value, which means that extrinsic value is going to get to zero when we get to expiration, hence why it increases. Back to the same options chain. And again, we're looking at the theta line here. And this is 30 days until expiration. So you'll see a deep in the money option has the lowest theta of 0.01. The at the money option has the highest of 0.04. And then the out of the money at 0.03. And again, we have the same mid prices, intrinsic and extrinsic value. Now, hopefully what I, you, I hope you noticed here, and I pointed to it when we were talking about Delta, is the high extrinsic value at at the money options. And that's because theta, we call it, is centered around at the money options. And that means there is the highest theta around the option that is closer to the, the strike price that's closer to the current market price. And that has some benefits and negative factors, but that's an important takeaway from here is where is theta centered and it makes sense because as the option moves deeper into the money, it starts acting like the stock, it removes its theta decay. And remember the options destination is zero or one at expiration. So keep that, keep that in mind. And as the option nears expiration, theta is going to magnify because it, it's going to completely deplete. And here is expiration for those options. And you'll notice still theta is centered around at the money options, but that option is only worth its executable value. So an example here. So how do we use it? It can tell us our extrinsic value exposure. When we create bull call spreads or um, we're long options and we're buying extrinsic value, that's a negative factor that we have to overcome. So we want to reduce our extrinsic value. And that's the intent of the bull call spread. We are buying theta, but we can sell an option and reduce it. And then when we talk about long butterflies, there's even more to reduce our cost as much as possible. And this is the cost aspect of long options. So this is going to benefit the seller hurt the buyer. And I mean that on a net basis, no matter if it's three or four legged or two legged strategy or single as in a net basis. And that's what we need to understand when we go on to the, the next section, but it can reveal altogether if you're positive or negative theta. And since it's centered around at the money options, that's where it really goes into strike price selection. Whereas Delta, it's constant. It's positive if it's bullish. If it's a bullish strategy, it is negative if it's a bearish strategy. Theta can have a bullish strategy even though it hinders long options. I'm talking about bull call spread here. But you can have a net long strategy and still be positive theta. And that's the way that we want to think about the Greeks and what they can help you do is we want to amplify the positive and mitigate the negative. Thetas, and I've said it multiple times, theta is negative for, for our long options and positive for a short. So for example, here, the bull call spread, we're mitigating our theta exposure. We're reducing the extrinsic value that we've purchased. The That's the give. The take is capping our upwards potential. So that's a great representation of that concept here. And then same with the bull put spread. The inverse is also true. Here is a net positive theta strategy because this is a sh net short option strategy that we're selling. Now what we're doing, because we're mitigating risk, so remember that for the options, there's always a give and take. We're mitigating risk 
which means we are taking away some of our positive factors, but we still want to make sure it remains positive. And that has to do with strike selection, meaning the dr strategy driver. That's why we choose something closer to the money. It's going to have a higher theta, which is a little more aggressive, but that's some reason for methodology behind the madness, if you will. All right, now hopefully we can get these positive and negative factors correct here. Um, so for long call, we're gonna go with theta first, have it in your mind, and long puts. So gonna be negative because it's a purchased option. If we attend, if you've attended any of my beginner sessions, anytime you hear the word long, I want you to think purchased, anytime short, sold, call the right to buy, put the right to sell, and that also helps put all the Greeks together. So if I have a purchased option, I am purchasing extrinsic value that is working against me. And if I sold an option, the inverse is true. I sold extrinsic value, it's working for me. So therefore theta is positive for short puts and short calls. That That's simple. Now, on to my favorite Greek, which is gamma. Gamma tells us, and this is a derivative of a derivative, so fun. How much does delta change when the underlying changes? So delta says if XYZ or Apple, whatever security moves by $1, what is my new options premium? Gamma tells you your new delta. So hopefully that makes sense, but I'm going to build on it. So if it doesn't, do not worry. But for example... If XYZ moves up by $1, you have a call with a 0.2 gamma, your delta is going to go up by 0.2. And if you have an XYZ call with a 0.08 gamma, then that moves delta up by 8 cents. So that's that's the change here. And how is this one measured? Just like delta, it's on that scale of negative 1 to positive 1. Now, this goes back to why I started with delta, saying the destination. Your destination when you're purchasing options is in either end. I'm going to focus on the long call side. So if I have a long call, maybe I bought something at the money, deeper in the money, further out of the money, no matter where I bought it on that scale, my goal is for it to have as much value as possible. And that occurs when delta gets to one. Gamma is your acceleration. So if you have a further out of the money option, you're going to have a lower gamma. So you're going to be on a bicycle, basically. But if we have something that has a higher gamma, which we'll talk about where that is, then you've got a, a better motor. Maybe you're in a Maserati or what those car people can give me a better analogy for that. But you want a higher acceleration because you're expecting a sharp directional move. And that's what gamma tells us. So therefore, gamma is going to benefit the buyer of the option because it's going to have a, it represents a sharp directional move it makes delta higher or closer to our destination. Therefore, that's great for us as we're buying options. If we're selling options, that equals risk. Because remember, our goal with short options is neutral to a slight directional bias. So we can either hang out where we are or move slightly up or down, depending if we're selling a call or a put. Whereas if we're buying a call or a put, we want it to go as far as it can in that direction. So that's why... Gamma helps us if we're purchasing and hurts us if we're selling. And it's acceleration. It's acceleration to your destination. And I'll show you that on the uh, on an options chain as well. But I, understanding gamma, I think, really helps you wrap your head around strategy selection very, very well. Nonetheless, this goes back to the stock event. If your stock moves up, your long cause more valuable, it's gonna have a positive impact on Delta because you're getting closer to your destination. If it's moving adversely in the long put, it's gonna have a negative impact on Delta because you're moving farther away from your destination. You're not getting to negative one, you're getting to zero. So let's look at it at on an options chain. So remember how extrinsic value is centered around at the money options. That's also where gamma is centered, is at the money options. And it also increases as we get closer to expiration. So a little bang, I'm so sorry. But this helps get some logic 
put together within the option. If you have, you're very deep in the money option, that's going to have a very, 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 very low gamma because gamma's job is to get the option to zero or positive one or negative one at expiration. That's its, its, its job. Once it gets it to its destination, it checks out. And that's how the gamma theta risk comes into play. So if you have a very deep in the money option, it's already at its destination. Gamma's done its job. It's leaving the situation. You have an at the money option. It's got more magnitude and acceleration. So it's got a bigger job to do. And that's where your bigger engines are located. And that's where if I'm buying options, when I'm looking at so strategy selection, I want something with a higher acceleration. So that's where I'm going to look at, at gamma at that point. My further out of the money options are going to have a lower gamma. And that's because it has a long time to get to its destination. It's that's, that's where your bicycles are. And that's because it, it doesn't move in tandem with the underlying security. Yes, they are cheaper, but they're cheaper for a reason. And there's more to build on that. And I tend to talk about them way too much. And now you'll see as we get closer to expiration, gamma still centered around at the money option. So this is the um, this is the day of expiration, the screenshot, and it is the highest at expiration. And this just shows you how it gets delta to either one or zero. So option is worth something or it's not. Here's where all the action is happening on the day of expiration. And then gamma is going to just give you its acceleration. And it is very much accelerating because extrinsic value is gone on the day of expiration. Um, so if you are trading those zero DTE options, we don't teach that here. But if you are, and um, gamma is something you definitely want to look at in order to approach that in a more, um, a better way, if you will. Um, and yes, whoever said the delta is velocity, gamma is acceleration, that works. I like that. Um, ooh, gamma squeeze, we could talk about that. Uh, I'd want to give you some examples of those considering that. So how do we actually use it? It's it's your sensitivity to the underlying. So one gives us traction, the other is sensitivity. Long options have a positive gamma. Hopefully I made that abundantly clear. It's because we expect a sharp directional move. That's why we started with that T-chart saying sharp directional bias. Short options have a negative gamma because a sharp directional move means you could be unprofitable very quickly. And that is not good for us. And then combined, you can see if you benefit from gamma. And if I have something like a bull call spread and remember how they're centered around at the money options. So again, this gives you a great idea of strategy selection. So here you've got a long call, a 100 strike and a 110 strike. As soon as this option is moving or the underlying is moving in my favor, meaning going above 110, going above my strike price, that is going to be closer to the money than the 100 call. So gamma is going to start magnifying at this 110 level. And eventually gamma is going to turn negative. And then this strategy turns into what's called a synthetic short put at that point, because now I don't need, I've, gamma's turned into risk, meaning a sharp move downwards will make me unprofitable. I've reached Maffet, max profit potential. So any, any movement could be bad for me. I just need the underlying to stay at 110 I'm so now I'm neutral to slightly directional bias or a little bit higher. See how that works to help you understand synthetic options if that's ever something you need to do. Gamma is just a great example of when to close your strategy, or when you're on max profit or when movement turns into risk. And that I think is the beauty of gamma because of, of entry and complete exit points. You want traction, you want that velocity, you want that acceleration. But once you've reached your destination, in this case, your maximum profit potential for a bull call spread is achieved when you reach that higher strike price. Neg gamma turns negative, time to exit that position because holding on to it, I'm not going to make any more money. And that's there's no reason to hold it. It just proves some points, but it's also very helpful in a lot of other ways. So moving on, I hope check time, you got this one right on what is positive and negative, but for long options, gamma is positive. 
because we're purchasing it. If we have a better acceleration, we are expecting a sharp directional movement in our directional bias. So therefore, gamma behooves us. And the inverse is true. It's negative for short options because we have a neutral and slight directional bias. So sharp movements are, are risky. That can make us unprofitable very, very quickly. And think about that. When you have a short option, gamma is the highest at expiration. That's why we don't hold short options until expiration because it equates to risk. We've Yes, there is a point in time where our theta decay around 14 till 21 days until expiration is it's going to start, it's not linear, it falls off a cliff right around 14 to 21 days. That allows us enough time to, to close it out and experience that theta collapse. But holding it as when our theta starts collapsing, our gamma starts increasing. And that's something called gamma theta risk, if you've ever heard of that before. And all that means is your time values depleting. There's not a lot of extrinsic value left in the option. Now you only have executable or intrinsic value exposure and that's where gamma comes from. And so now any acceleration movement is could make you unprofitable or very profitable, depending if you're long or short. And the way to wrap your head around that is understanding what's positive or negative. So hopefully that, that makes sense there. And um, long gamma just means your net, net long gamma, as in I'm adding, we were for the bull call spread, when we had our strategy selection. So if I'm purchasing the long call, that's closer to the money, selling a further out of the money options, that is net long gamma. So you literally, if you remember back in math class, when you added positive and negatives, that's how you do it. So moving on to Vega. This one, I won't go into too much more detail, but if you get gamma, Vega works very, very similarly. Um, so how much does volatility affect my option is what Vega tells us. And it is the measurement. So remember, this is changes what affects my options premium. Vega shows the if implied volatility moves by one percentage point up or down, what is my new premium? Vega is not implied volatility. That is a different metric. This is the change in implied volatility and how it affects my options premium. So if you have a IV moving up by 1%, you've got a call with a 0.17 vega, it's going to increase the premium. So think about that. If IV moves higher, we have more implied volatility. It makes a long call more valuable. That's the way I'm looking at that. And this is by how much, essentially. So that means it tells us our volatility exposure because of what it measures. So Vega, like theta, is expressed in dollar amounts, could be any dollar value. And it is positive for long options because if we're purchasing an option, a movement in implied volatility benefits that option premium and makes it higher in price. So therefore it is positive, benefits buyers, and it hurts sellers if we have an increase. And that's why when you're attending our sessions or listen to any of our live events, we'll say, oh, implied volatility is high. That's why I'm choosing to sell this option. Or we'll say implied volatility um, is lower. That's why I'm choosing to buy. Or implied volatility is higher, but I actually really expect a sharp directional move. So I'm going to structure this with a, a long call broken wing butterfly. And we're going to go through that, that strategy, I believe, next session. So it's going to help this is the reasons why we structure the trades the way that we do, because the intent is to always magnify the positive and mitigate the negative. That's why this was foundationally important for those three and four-legged option strategies that were asked for. So the main difference here, aside from the other ones with Vega, is it is higher the further out until expiration. So that it, it affects the, the further the out options more than the close, closer options. And it is also centered around at the money options. So you'll see your deeper in the money here has the lowest Vega of 0 0.088. And then we've got our further out of the money option at 0.339 and our at the money option at 0.39. But looking at this, 
is better netted together. So let's talk about how we actually use it. So it shows us our volatility exposure. If I'm expecting an increase in implied volatility, like earnings or a news event or something like that coming up, I want to be net positive vega. And remember, because an option is vega is centered around at the money, it's going to change on a net basis, depending on my strategy selection. So I'm using that bull call spread again. If I am choosing my long option, my strategy driver for that, that long call to be closer to the money, I'm going to have a greater Vega exposure. Whereas the short call is going to mitigate that, but it decreases my extrinsic value purchased, it decreases my acceleration, but it's a way you structure where it doesn't decrease it so much. And it it there's a lot that goes into that. But Combined, it's just telling me, am I exposed to an increase in volatility or not? And that really helps when we're determining hedging strategies or you're concerned with volatility on the inverse side. I talk about this from benefic benefiting and mitigating because that's the way you understand the positive and negative values. But if you're concerned with something, maybe you, you want to have a, a a strategy that is not going to benefit from an increase in implied volatility because you're concerned. Or there's there's so many ways that you can structure this, and hopefully this added some clarity as to why it's important to know this because it helps you understand strategy selection, and not only strategy selection but strike price selection. But the beauty of the Greeks is options place tools are really built around this, and that's why it generates those ideas based on probabilities and other factors already considering this to take the hard work away. So adding Vega, positive and negative factors for long options, what do we think it's going to be? Positive, makes sense. An increase in implied volatility makes the premium more expensive, which means my long options are going to benefit. I want them to go up in value as much as possible. Whereas short options, an increase in implied volatility is going to make it more expensive, and I want to be able to buy to close those options at a lower price. So therefore, Vega is negative for short options. And then netting together is how we determine those other things. All right, so that was your foundational elements primer on the Greeks. So we can dive deeper in the rest of the month into those two, three, and four-legged strategies, mainly three and four-legged strategies. Um, we're going to cover how to... Um, we're going to do long haul butterflies next. So directional, um, we've been through short in there and straddles and strangles. You asked for iron condors. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about structuring those around earnings and probable moves. So we'll definitely discuss a lot of more advanced stuff. And someone very specifically put in there, and I loved that question. I'm sorry, I don't have the name remembered on top of my head. Um, said, I am expecting a downwards turn in the S&P 500. How do I utilize index options to hedge my entire portfolio? And we're going to cover that too. So then we'll have to, we'll have to know beta. That's the other Greek that I'll, I'll throw at you, but not so difficult. Um, so I hope this was helpful. I'm going to check time. Got about five minutes. Let me see if there is any other questions. Um, and I see your question on gamma squeeze. We can cover that. That has to do, it's a lot more detail that goes into that, but with the meme stocks and the pressure to buy and eventually send something that's overly shorted up is part of the gamma squeeze. But if you guys want a presentation on what happened there and just pulling it up and going in detail, I'm happy to do that. No problem. Um, you can get the recording as long as you've attended this session and then you're on an options play free trial. Phil will, our wonderful, there he is. He's just, he hears me say that. He's so great. Um, you just click that link there. Options play is free for 30 days. So you can just try it out and then you'll get a recording to this. And we do put them on YouTube as well. Um, and if you're a member, you got it. And we are working on revamping our website where you can see these at a later date in a chronological order. Uh, all right. Why does a 0.2 delta tell us a 20% out of the money? So the best way that I can explain that is by the 0.5 delta. So your 0.5 delta is at the money, which means you have a 50% probability of it being in the money 
were out of the money. And that's because if it moves by one penny, it will be either way. It's a twine cost at, at that point, right? So just move that to a further out of the money option. Point two, it's it's just where it is relative to the price. Like that's the math behind it. So it has a 20% because it's already that far away. That's it. Um, do the Greeks change intraday? Yes, some of them do. Think about Delta is going to use the 0.5. Is that the money option? As the underlying security moves, Delta moves. So yes, you'll see those move. And then Gamma's going to move. It's all, all moving around. Where do we get trend and implied volatility? We don't show that on the options play platform, but your broker probably does. It's on those active trader platforms. You can even pull them on the Greeks too, if you ever heard of the implied volatility smile and things like that. Um, but unfortunately I don't have I don't have one to show you up at the moment. Um, all right. Jens, I saw that you said, hmm, difficult. I hope this made it have some clarity. We did kind of fly through that. But on the next sessions, this is all the foundational elements. And if you didn't fully grasp it all the way, that's totally fine. But once we start putting actual strategies together, and then what happens to the Greeks when we layer things together, it'll start making more sense. You got to get your hands a little dirty. So we'll we'll do that next week. Um, all right. Sure. Okay. So I think that's all the questions. If you guys have any other thoughts for this session or anything for next week, we're running through some ideas to revamp for 2024. So thank you for filling out that survey. If you didn't, you can always email info at optionsplay.com, throw something in the chat, but we are happy to certainly help. Um, Bob, you'll get this later. Thanks everyone. I will see you next week.